All right, welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews right here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe, become a member, sign up for Patreon, all those things. Uh, and then you can be asking questions of the guests. Guests like the one I have today, Britt Lightning from the band Vixen is here. I feel like I see Britt all the time because uh, Stephen Piercy and Vixen play so many shows together. But uh, we never really get a chance to talk, although we saw each other at the Rainbow uh, Bar and Grill Bash, and uh, and I, you know, I just did my whole interview there, and now I'm an expert on all things Brit Lightning, uh, Vixen. That she's a lead guitar player for the band Vixen. Vixen has a new single, Red. It's available everywhere right now, and uh, I recommend you check that out. Brit is also the musical director at Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. She's got all kinds of other cool things. So we're gonna get to know as much about Brit as we can in the next 30 minutes, right? After this, welcome, Brit Lightning. Hello, Jason. Good to see Hi, you. Good to see you as well. And thank you for coming on here last second. I should point out one of the reasons we're talking so last second is this Saturday which would be tomorrow from the airing of this, uh, October 14th. Vixen, Slaughter, Great White, Stephen Piercy in Mulvane, Kansas. And we want to make sure tickets are still available. Everybody should come out for, uh, it's, I think it's called the 80s Invasion. Yes, at the Kansas Star Casino. Kansas Star Casino. At least one of us uh, knows where they're going. <laughs> so. But I'm looking forward to seeing you there. And everyone coming out, it's, it's so much fun to see these kind of packages. So Britt, like I said, we've got 30 minutes to learn all we can about you, but I okay. want to talk a little bit about Vixen first, because on this show, at times I've been hard on bands that have less than two original members, one original member. The case of Vixen is a little different. The other original members of Vixen um, are supportive of what you guys do. Um, Janet has, was on the show and said that she gave her blessing. She wanted to do her own thing, and she gives her blessing to Vixen continuing. Cher has said the same thing and sort of passed the torch. And so Roxy is keeping alive uh, a Vixen with, with you guys, which I would consider uh, a strong lineup. People really enjoy seeing you guys, and you're not just sort of, uh, we're going to play those hits. You're, you have new music. The new single, Red, is out. So tell me, uh, you when you joined Vixen, it was still... Janet and Cher in the band, right? That's right. So it was the original lineup um, right when I joined. Yeah. Um, and then, so now I'm the second most senior member in the, in the band. So <laughs> <That's> crazy, right? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed all the different iterations of the lineup. Uh, you know, everybody is, is different and unique. And but the best part is everybody is an amazing player and everybody plays with so much soul. And, um, so I think I think every lineup brings something a little different um, to the show. And, you know, with, with Lorraine, she's she's been really great. It's really hard to sh fill the shoes of a lead singer um, that everybody loves. And she has done that a, an amazing job, I think. Um, she kind of reminds me of a David Lee Roth on stage. I mean, she was the first one to jump in the crowd and go crowd surfing at the Wacken Festival in Germany with all the metal heads. I mean, she's fearless um, and she's really helped uh, lead the band forward and, and uh, help keep it going in a great way. And of course, love Julia. And then, of course, Roxy just hits harder than ever. Still, it's just never ceases to amaze me. Like every time I see her play, it's just always more amazing than the last. So, um, yeah, I feel like the lineup is awesome and strong and uh, just so happy to be able to uh, keep the Vixen legacy alive. Yeah. And I will say that uh, as the time of the recording of this, today is the anniversary of Jan's passing away. I believe it's been 10 years uh, and you shared this great photo uh, um, of yourself, uh, a much younger Brit Lightning meeting uh, Jan. Can you tell me, uh, and we'll look at that now, can you tell me about how this meeting happened? Yes, so that was at the Webster Theater in Connecticut, Hartford, Connecticut. And um, it's funny because I knew that my friend who was a photographer took that and uh, after I joined, he didn't find it for like three until three years after I was in the band. He was like, I finally found the picture you're always asking me for. And um, and yeah, so my band had uh, opened up not for them directly, but there's like two rooms in that venue. We had played, I think, one of the other rooms. 
or maybe we had opened up directly for them. I can't remember, but I had played earlier that night and Jan's version of Vixen, uh, which did not include uh, Cher Janet or Rock um, or Roxy at the time, uh, were performing. And, uh, you know, I was always a Jan fan. And so I was like, oh, I got to get a picture with her. And who would have thought? I mean, gosh, I don't even know how old I was then. I was, I don't know if I was like a senior in high school or I'm not sure, but. Uh, you know, flash forward to, to today, I never would have expected that. And uh, so it's it's pretty cool that I have that photo. I really love that photo. Yeah, it's great. And uh, when I saw it, I, you know, I thought, what a cool sort of legacy uh, yeah. for Vixen that you got to meet her uh, that many years ago. And now you're the lead guitar player in Vixen. So well, let's, let's rewind and we'll catch up to where we're at now. Uh, you, are you from Boston? Is that where you're from, that area? I am. I'm representing today too. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. That's like a cue card. I should have uh, no. I should have took the time. <laughs> yeah. So I grew up in Boston. Um, I went to school at Northeastern in Boston. Studied music business. I really wanted to go to Berkeley. You know, growing up in Boston, Berkeley School of Music. I was always jamming with older kids that had graduated from Berkeley. I played in bands with them, and I, I would tell my parents like, I really want to go to Berkeley and and study guitar. And my dad was like. I don't, I don't think so. I don't really get it. He goes, Johnny over here graduated from Berkeley and he works at Starbucks and uh, same with Justin. And uh, he's like, I don't get it. He, they're not working in the music industry after all that money. So I don't think we're going to support you in that. Um, <laughs> he's like, Jimi Hendrix didn't go to Berkeley. He didn't go to Berkeley. So um, I think you'll just figure that out if you want to do music, but you should go for like a backup plan, you know? So I ended up studying uh, music business. That was our happy medium. Um, and, uh, and that was fun. You know, I learned a lot about business and I, I use that today uh, still in my own uh, dealings and I've always represented myself. So that's been helpful. Yeah. Well, Cher from Vixen went to Berkeley. And she did. She, she formerly of Vixen. She made a, a good go at it. And uh, her roommate was Amy Mann from Till Tuesday. Did you know that? No, I don't think she ever told me that. Yeah, she told me. Uh, but yeah. so a small, uh, small world at, at Berkeley. So I think you probably made the best decision. Uh, the music business will always uh, exist. Playing music, not always finding gigs isn't always the easiest, but there will always be someone who needs you. When you and I were talking, we we're talking a little bit about law. You had a little bit of a legal experience as well. And I said, that is also a skill that you will always need. Yes, that's one of the biggest skills you will need because there's all these loopholes and everybody always trying to uh, pull one over on you. So understanding that lingo is super important. Um, when I first moved to LA from Boston, I realized, you know, I kind of went into a shock, like, oh my God, everything's so much more expensive out here. Maybe it's time for me to grow up and just stop going on tour and get a real job. Maybe that's what I'm supposed to do, you know, here in LA. So I took a job at Universal Records and um, I was actually in the legal department. Um, and uh, so I, I did get a good taste of that. Um, but I, as, as interesting as I did find the work, I, I enjoy reading contracts and everything. But I really um, didn't like the sitting at the desk for like, you know, 10 hours a day. Um, <laughs> I prefer to do that, like, you know, on a tour bus. So um, <laughs> I realized that kind of lifestyle wasn't totally cut out for me. So well, you, you, you also, you had the music in you, so to speak. Uh, who would have thought that shopping with your mother at a Ralph Lauren, uh, <laughs> who, 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 who uh, would ever forever change your life. The story goes that you were shopping with your mother and eruption of all things, who knew they played eruption at Ralph Lauren? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> but that's when you knew it was time to put down the flute and switch the guitar, right? Yeah, that's exactly how it went down. Yes, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Well, talk about a, um, you know, life-changing moment, hearing that music, knowing now I have to do this. Tell me about how you decide, how you figure out you're going to play the guitar. Yeah, so I wasn't really sure. I just knew, you know, and I didn't think about being in a band or anything like that. I just knew I, I wanted to be able to do that, to make that noise, those sounds of eruption, like the toe tapping thing. It just blew my mind. Didn't know how it was happening. Just knew I had to do it. Um, so, um you know, then I started high school, like maybe the, the week after that. And I was a new school and it was a private school and it had no extracurricular programs. So there was no, you know, I used to play the flute in the band in school and they didn't have that. They didn't have course, They didn't have anything. Um, but one day I was staying after school and I heard a guitar echoing in the hallway after after hours. And I was like, what is that? An electric guitar. So I followed the sound and uh, I popped my head in and it was a group of boys and um, 
a teacher that has left his classroom open for them. And uh, they go, this is a guitar club. Do you play guitar? And I said, well, no, not yet. And they were like, well, if you don't play guitar, you can't come in. And so I was like, all right. Uh, and so I kind of just like walked away and thinking like, I better get a guitar and start practicing. But then the teacher came out and was like, hey, listen, if you really are interested in guitar, not just the, one of the boys in here, I can help you out and don't let them intimidate you. And um, I can like show you a couple chords and stuff on, on, and I have a spare guitar. So he let me borrow his acoustic. And I learned, you know, my basic uh, first position chords. And then uh, the teacher said, you know, you should join the liturgical music group. And so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not really religious. Like, well, my mom's uh, Jewish, my dad's Catholic, but I kind of, you know, not a temple or church person either way. And uh, so I was like, well, that would be great if I could play and practice guitar during this mass instead of sleeping through it, that would, that, that would be great. So that was my first gig. So I started playing on the Wednesday masses um, and I got to practice guitar, but then I convinced my dad to, to buy me a guitar. Um, and uh, an electric. And uh, I started playing all the Van Halen and all the Metallica that I possibly could. And then fast forward to later years, I became guitar club president and uh, started this uh, open jam in the school cafeteria once a month, um, like a coffee house night and, um, and then formed my first band. And uh, yeah, started playing in bars and clubs when I was 17. Yeah, you didn't uh, you didn't waste any time, and I bet we don't know the names of any of the boys in the guitar club. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, they were hesitant about you joining. You went on to be the president, and you went on to be uh, a successful uh, musician. I think any musician who's working is a successful musician, but you've gone uh, uh, beyond and above that. Um, so it's interesting. So you talk about when you it was jaded your first band. It was, it was. Uh, well, no, my first band that I, I toured with, um, it was funny. I, I, I went into a, uh, remember Daddy's Junkie Music? Guitar Center bought them out, but it was an East Coast uh, brand of, of guitar know. stores. Anyways, I went in there to buy, uh, to look at heads because I decided I needed a half stack um, because the practice amp was too small for my bedroom. And, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, just playing in the bedroom, I should have a half stack. So uh, when I was testing out heads there, the store manager came over and said, hey, uh, you play a lot of Metallica. I got a band. We sound a lot like Metallica. We just lost our guitar player today and we're going on tour next week. Uh, it's a two week tour, like DIY van tour. Are you in? And I was like, yep. And I told my mom later that night that I was doing it. And she was like, wait, what? Um, and, you know, so she interviewed, she had the whole band come over the house. They were called uh, Stillwell Angels. She had the whole band come over the house. They were all guys in their twenties and she interviewed them and was like, is this safe? And, you know, and somehow she let me go. I was like, I'll still do my homework on the road. And so that was the first band I, I played with. Um, and, and that's when I just caught the bug immediately. Cause I was like, I'm away on my own. I'm independent. Uh, people other than my parents tell me I, I'm pretty good. Like when we play these shows, like we're getting a great response and just that feeling of travel and the unknown and excitement and freedom and, you know, playing music every night. I was just like, I'm hooked. That was it. Yeah. And, and so Jada comes after that because there's a lot of yeah. YouTube clips of your playing with Jada and you were already starting to make a little bit of a, your, a name for yourself doing that. Yeah, we, um, we, yeah, we played some good shows. We, you know, we, we did a lot in the local East coast scene and, and then we went overseas and stuff. We did a tour with opening for wasp, uh, over in Europe and, uh, mm -hmm. did some, you know, some other cool shows. So, uh, yeah, and we did some good recordings. I got to put them on Spotify. Everybody always asks me, I, I don't have them up there. I need to upload them, but, um, but it was a good band. It was a really good stepping stone. Yeah, and and you were playing original music, which a lot of it's a hard thing. A lot of people survive playing covers and other things. You guys were doing it on your own, and yeah. uh, so how does that band end, or why does it end? Either you know, we went through a couple singers. That was the tough part, keeping the singer. Um, for some reason, all of our singers had like jealous boyfriend husbands, and there was always some kind of drama that was like, oh, life's going to be easier if I'm not in the band, and. Uh, and then I finally got sick of just replacing band member after band member like that. And my friend said, you know what? You should just go audition for another band and just be a guitar player for hire. And then all you have to worry about is just plugging in your guitar and playing. Because I was like booking all the shows. I was, you know, just doing everything. Um, and I was like, you know what? At this point, that sounds pretty good. And so um, I did one audition. Uh, really, that was like my main audition I ever did. And then although I didn't get that gig, um, 
I got another gig and many gigs from that one audition from well, just this- between me because it was a big open call. So there was a lot of people at this audition. Um, like hundreds that audition of was Lady Gaga, right? That's right. That's a pretty, pretty big uh, audition. Yes. And she was, uh, she, yeah, she was replacing all of her band members, backup singers, dancers. So there was a lot of people there. And um, what did so, you have to do with the audition? You know, she, they just said, well, at first she wasn't there. It was, it was like, um, there were like four different guys kind of like, it almost felt like the voice behind like a, a table. They were all like four different people. One person looked really hip hop. One person looked really metal. One person kind of had like the very, like a, a good mix of people. And uh, they just said, impress us. That's what they said. And it was funny. Cause I was like cramming all the Lady Gaga songs on the, on the train ride. I took the train from Boston and, um, and then I got there and I was like, Oh, I don't have to play any of these songs. So I just, I just kind of made up a solo and just started jamming and, um that was it yeah (laughs) and obviously like you said a lot of people auditioning for that gig tell me the gig you get out of that because you didn't get that one but you did get something right i got all the callbacks i was runner up but then i ended up um i got the gig with alejandro sans from that so um uh, one of alejandro's old bass players was uh there and he was one of the mds and uh, he knew that alejandro was looking for a guitar player he wasn't in the band any longer but he was still in touch with that camp and uh so then i auditioned for that um and i and i got the gig i video auditioned for that because they were based out of madrid and then, uh, and then I went off to Madrid for rehearsals, and then uh, that was a great like three year tour, world tour. It was it was amazing. We played the Latin music Grammys, all kinds of cool things, yeah. and places when you were in your bedroom in Boston, you never thought you would see. I mean, you really <laughs> that's so true, so true. Yeah. And you, you, you became one of these players who, you, you fit into all these different niches for other artists that needed it. Jason Derulo. Uh, another one that was very popular. And so you're here you are on, uh, I still call it Regis and Kathy Lee. Even, yeah, though, neither, <laughs> even though neither one are there. Uh, uh, but Kelly and Michael at the time, yeah. you find yourself playing live with Jason Derulo. Also Rachel Platten, uh, Fight Song, which was a major song. Everybody watching knows it in their head from either a commercial or, or, or somewhere. But you got that gig for a while as well. Yes. Yes. Yep. That was a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, yeah, we did some cool gigs with that. A lot of festivals and radio and TV shows got to do good morning America. We played the finale of America's got talent on that one. And yeah, so that, that was a lot of fun too. Yeah. I mean, these are great opportunities. So what happens after that? Uh, so after that I moved to LA, um, I was going to go on another tour cycle with Alejandro, after the Rachel Platten stuff. Um, and then two weeks before I was supposed to go to Madrid, you know, had plane ticket all ready to go for rehearsals, uh, changed management companies, changed the whole thing, uh, cut the budget, changed the band, changed the whole vibe. So um, that was a letdown. And I just remember it was uh, February, you know, winter time, and we had so much snow, all the roads were closed and it was coming up on my birthday. I couldn't get together with all my friends because nobody could drive anywhere. And I was just sitting in my condo in Boston and I was like, why do I even live here? I always had a picture of the LA skyline framed and I was looking at it and I was like, I got to go to LA. Like, that's it. So um, like, I just started packing that night and I I just, just set on going. Um, and it came out, uh, to LA, got the job at universal records. Um, I started, uh, jamming, just going to the jam nights and uh, jam scenes. I started playing in an all female, um, guns and roses tribute, um, around LA, which was a lot of fun. And then, uh, and then from that, um, Vixen's manager saw me, uh, play at one of the, uh, the jam nights. And we also had played the monsters of rock cruise and our manager runs, runs that cruise as well. Yeah. And he had known that Nixon was looking for a, a, new, a new guitarist and wanted to keep going. So, uh, yeah, he recommended me. And then I went down to Florida on audition for the band and uh, got the gig. And that was, uh, yeah, almost what, like seven years ago now or 2017, yeah. whatever that was. Yeah. Time flies. Yeah. Time and, flies. Yeah. And you, you've, been, you've been on people's radar because I think. Not just are you the guitar player in Vixen, but as we mentioned, you're also the musical director at Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. Um, you do lots of different things. The Vixen schedule allows you to do that. Not just Vixen, but most bands of that genre. You know, if you do 40 shows a year, it's a great year uh, because most of it is fly dates. It's not like, very rare that you're going to get on a, on, on a bus. 
Um, some of the shows you do, though, that Vakken show was incredible. I, it's on YouTube. I watched it. What an amazing experience. You probably never would have thought that would happen with Vixen, especially. Yeah, you know, Vakken has been on my radar since I was a teenager. Like, I was always like, whoa, I want to, because I was super into metal as a kid. And I was just like, wow, if I could ever play that festival, that's like a dream come true. So that was been a bucket list since I was like yeah 16 so that was really really cool didn't didn't expect that um and you know we actually surprisingly play a lot of metal festivals and it goes over so great i'll never forget i just want to share this funny story we played a, a metal festival in finland uh a couple years back uh when uh sharon uh janet were in the band and i just remember showing up and and the the, the flyer for the show you know the teachers all the band logos were uh, just completely you couldn't read them it was all like stick lettering and so i didn't know who the heck was on it except for us and i was thinking how are we going to fit in this looks like a death metal festival we show up it's pouring torrential rain mud everywhere there's everybody looks like a viking like these big european guys with big beards and everybody's covered in mud it's waving flags and i was like oh my god how are we going to get out there? I'm thinking of playing like crying, right? Like, how is that going to go over with this crowd? Right. But I'll tell you what, we got out there and we rocked it. And all the Vikings in the front row were singing along to every word. It was, I, it was, it was awesome. It was so cool. So somehow we yeah. do keep it in those, that, that scene somehow too. And and we're, we're heavy live, you know, a lot of people hear the record and then they see, see the show for the first time. And they'll be like, I had no idea you guys were going to be so heavy. You know, because Roxy's heavy back there and, and we all play hard. So, yeah. I think that was, I thought that the first time I saw Vixen, I was a little late to the Vixen party. I knew the songs, you know, I knew them from MTV, but I started seeing them on those cruises and things like that and realizing that they are heavy, that it is heavy and that there are some great songs and some catchy songs. How did the new song Red come about? Yeah. So, you know, we, we were talking about putting out an album versus a single and then just in the, you know, aspect of time, we just figured, let's just put out a single, you know, that's kind of what everybody's doing lately. We can do a video. We can just focus on that. And, um, you know, we had been talking with Fred Curry, who is a great songwriter. He's been doing a lot now for, you know, TV and film scoring and things like that and sports games. So, um, yeah, we, we worked with him on it and uh, and we just thought the tune was super catchy and uh, and he helped produce it. We recorded it with him. And um, I think it's a really good blend of like modern, but still, you know, very rock um, and reminiscent of the original Vixen sound, too. Yeah, I think you guys made the right move with the single opposed to the record. And I feel like records can get lost in the shuffle. You can always make another single, uh, keep making singles until you have a record. But I think you guys did really good at getting people's attention. You made a good video. Uh, you guys have all been out promoting it. And, you know, for your sets, you could, you know, most of the time you can only play so many songs. Vixen has so many songs as it is that having one new song, I think, fits, uh, fits well into your, into your set, as opposed to having a whole record of songs that might get lost in the, in the shuffle. True, true. Yep. And, and the world is, uh, only has the attention span for singles mostly these days. <laughs> It's crazy, but it's true. We forgot the name. You know, when we were younger, we knew the names of every song on every record uh, and mm -hmm. what was on side one and what was on side two. Now, you know, like you said, our attention spans are on to the next thing so fast. You guys look like you're having so much fun every time I see you on the road. You, you know, uh, you look like you all really get along and are happy to be around each other. That's a rare thing in this industry, as you probably know. <laughs> It sure is. And I am grateful for that every single day, because the last thing you want to do is spend all your time sitting around at airports and on buses and on flights and with people that you don't like. So I'm so grateful. I mean, we hang out even when we don't have to. Um, <laughs> we're always together. Um, and uh, yeah, they're like family and my best friends. So um, yeah, it is very rare. And I'm very grateful for that. It makes a huge difference. And then you can really be genuine on stage and get into the music because you're not in your head about, oh, this person said this. And you know, <laughs> I, yeah, I think that does make a difference. Yeah, I've seen a little bit of both in my uh, my time. Um, yeah. I will tell you that there was one show, Stephen Pierce, Slaughter and Dixon, and it was a rainstorm. Uh, it was the Mark Twain's place. I can't remember. That's what right. That's right. We were in... Um, Hannibal, Missouri. That's right. Hannibal, Missouri. Yeah. And uh, and everyone did their best and played. And but it was crazy. But the, the dressing rooms were a, a haunted house. Uh, and it was a, when we weren't there, it's a haunted house. 
might have been haunted while we were there too. But I remember seeing your rider, Dixon's rider, and Slaughter's rider, and I said, I got to see what these people put on their riders. <laughs> and uh, now Stephen's rider is dry. There's no alcohol uh, in our dressing room, which is fine because there's enough in your dressing room for an entire liquor store. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the truth? <laughs> no, you guys, uh, no, you, 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 ladies know how to party. Uh, I've never seen so much uh, uh, booze. You, you guys are set. If you're having company, I mean, if anyone wants to have a drink on tour, stop by Vixen's. Stop by our room. Well, I'll tell you what. The problem is, we all have a different preference. Not one of us yeah. drinks the same thing. I want the whiskey. Um, you know. Uh, Julia wants the beer. Lorraine wants the margarita mix or the champagne or the vodka. And Roxy wants the wine. So, you know, we got to make everybody happy. That's, that's, that's the trouble. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? You, you're, you're on the road. You travel so far to be there. You know, for whatever the time of your set is, people have no idea how many hours you spent on planes, in airports, in hotel rooms, and dressing rooms. This show that uh, we'll be doing Saturday night, it sounds like, oh, well, it's just a one-off. It's Saturday. Well, no, there'll be Friday traveling. There'll be Saturday playing. And then Sunday, back in those airports traveling again. I say constantly on this show, if your favorite band comes to town, don't say I'll catch them next time because uh, they came a long way to see you. True. And and I just want to point out, there's no non-stops to this airport we're going to. So Yeah. <laughs> Michael flights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, that's why they have that saying, uh, musicians, we get paid to travel uh, and then we just play music for fun. But that's what we do. We get paid to travel because <laughs> that's the majority of our job out there. That's what we're doing most of the time. Yeah. The show is free. The travel is definitely. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> is, is definitely be ours. Tell me a little bit about uh, Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, how that came about. Yeah, so I uh, started working with Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp in 2019. I uh, I had always been interested in it, and Cher had done it before, and I had just seen random people posting about it, and I didn't really get what it was. And so I reached out to, to David Fishoff, and uh, he invited me to be a counselor, and he's this owner of it. It's been going on for over 25 years now. And um, uh, I did my first rock camp. It was uh, a Cheap Trick-themed rock camp where you perform live with Cheap Trick at the Whiskey A Go-Go. And... Um, uh, you know, I, I hit it off with David and he liked the fact that I had a business background, but I was also a musician. So I understood both, both sides of the coin there. And, uh, I just started working with him and planning camps, but then right as we started COVID hit. And, um, so then, uh, we were trying to figure out a way to keep it going. And I hosted over 170 master classes, online master classes with, uh, various rock stars during COVID to kind of keep things going, which was it was amazing. It gave me a lot of inspiration and hope during that time too. Uh, but I, I got to speak to people like Roger Daltrey of the who and Alice Cooper and Joe Elliott. And uh, you know, everybody was in a weird state of mind. We weren't sure if anybody was ever going to step on a stage again, you know, really we didn't know what was going on. So it was a, it was an interesting time to talk to people and, and get their perspectives um, and to talk to them when it, they weren't doing press to just promote an album or a tour cycle. It was kind of like really genuine. And um, so that was very cool. And uh, we still have those in the archive somewhere. I think we're going to try to do something with that to bring some of those interviews to light because they're very cool. Um, and then we started bringing back the live camps um, in 2022. And uh, we did eight camps that year. Um, and the camps are these four day events where you get together, uh, you know, musicians of any level. Um, and I place you in bands. I'm the musical director. And um, you're, you join a band mentored by a rock star counselor. I'm one of the counselors along with, uh, you know, Vinny Apice from Black Sabbath and Dio. We got Tony Franklin from The Firm. Um, Rudy Sarzo of Quiet Riot are all like, you know, counselors that have been doing it for a long time. They mentor the band and they help you prepare to jam with the big special guests that come in. Sometimes it's Paul Stanley, Kiss, or, you know, um, uh, we got Nancy Wilson coming up, uh, Stone Temple Pilots, all sorts of different um, artists come back and do this. And then you also get to perform two live shows. And uh, so I've been busy uh, working on that. Our next camp is a Metal Mania camp where you get to play live with Zach Wilde at the Whiskey at Go-Go and also jam with Marty Friedman and Mike Portnoy. Uh, so that's going to be cool. So I'm always just working and planning, planning those. Um, I also started the first ever women's only uh, rock and roll fantasy camp, which was great. Yeah. Yeah. It was really cool. Cause I just, you know, of course as a woman, I see less women in this field of rock and roll than, I mean, it's, it's changing slowly, but like, I noticed at the rock camps, there was only a handful of women, women, and we have like, you know, 70, 80 people at a rock camp and it was maybe like five women. And I was like, 
I think it's because there, there is still an intimidation factor a little bit. Um, and it's nobody's fault. It's just kind of the way it is. And, um, and I remember David saying, if we only get five women at each camp, how do you expect to fill a whole camp of women? Maybe women just aren't as into it. And I said, no, nah, I think, I don't know. So anyways, for the special guests at that camp, we had Melissa Etheridge, Nancy Wilson, Kathy Valentine, and, um, um, uh oh, and Orianthe. And, wow. um, and so that was, and, and it sold out and it was a really amazing camp and I, it was pretty magical. I thought it was, I thought it was really neat. It was very supportive and uh, encouraging and yeah, it was magical. So that's been a blast and I uh, luckily can, you know, help work on the camps and stuff from the road too. So I'm, I'm able to, to do both and, and it's, it's fulfilling because sometimes I feel like, oh man, if I'm just playing music all day long, I feel like sometimes I don't work the other part of my brain. Um, like the numbers business side. And I, I like, I miss that. And I kind of feel like, Oh, I got to do something else. So, so this, uh, this is fulfilling. Well, it's a lot of work. I did some work with fantasy camp when Kip Winger was the musical director oh, yeah. Yeah. and it's a lot, it's a lot of work and yes. you're constantly dealing with um, the, the other musicians, the counselors, you're trying to make sure you do the best job of pairing people up based on a skill level too, because there are some people who come in who really have never played and, uh, so you have to try to figure it out that's a, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of coordinating and a million songs you have to know a million songs and teach a million songs um and so uh but i as you were talking about the women's event i thought it was such a great thing it's a tricky thing when i have female artists on this show because you don't want to say oh well you're one of the top female guitar players you know it's almost a backwards compliment you know you know <laughs> you want to tell someone that you're one of the top musicians you know it doesn't matter gender but as you said there is still this, uh, this the intimidation, there is still something to it. Uh, sometimes music being a boys club. I've had a few female artists on the show and I say, have you ever had issues with sound people or someone who thinks that maybe they know more than you because you're a woman and maybe they haven't heard you play. And then afterwards they go, oh, whoops. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep, yep, I, I do know what you mean. <laughs> now Vixen's a little different. It's a band of women, so it's... It, it, uh, you know, you know what you're getting, but sometimes when you have someone who's filling in they, or playing with a, a, in a group of other guys, it's such a tricky thing to say, oh, well, she's one of the top female guitar players or, or those type of things. But the women's only camp is, it, I think, is something that gets people out because there's so many people learning on YouTube now and, you know, learning at, at all levels and women mm -hmm. are, are playing just as good as men, if not better in a lot of cases. I can name tons of people. Uh, but I, I won't because we'd get in trouble. Um, <laughs> you know, I think uh, guitar sales are, are more, a higher percentage of women are buying guitars than, than men now. I know that was the case during COVID. Um, and yeah, I think it has a lot to do with social media and, and YouTube and the accessibility of, you know, the, all the information where you can learn to play. And um, it's pretty awesome. I, I love seeing that. But um, I, like I also it. don't get offended when, you know, if somebody said like, you can't get offended by anything. Like, so that doesn't bother me. Like if somebody says good for a, a girl or something. I, I think sometimes people these days can get too offended by like, you know, certain things. And it's like, nobody's, I don't think intentionally trying to make you feel bad by that kind of comment, you know? So I like, I, I get it. I mean, if you break it down, sure. But you know, but I get it, you know, Hey, a compliment still a compliment. <laughs> That's how I look at things too. But uh, you know, sometimes you have to have a little bit of a, a thick skin. I love the guitars you play, the Epiphone guitars. Uh, and, and for a lot of reasons, I think also because they're affordable guitars. And I think that that's a great thing as, as inspiration to someone who might be a little bit younger and listen, maybe can't go out and buy this guitar. And sometimes maybe the lesson, I've seen some amazing musicians uh, and it's in their hands. And uh, I've watched Jeff Skunk Baxter pick up a guitar that might as well have been a toy and made it sound incredible. Uh, or Jimmy Crespo, who I used to work with for, uh, from Aerosmith, uh, he would he could play anything and make it sound good but so i think that it's nice that you have a guitar that people can actually buy yeah they're, they're great guitars and, and they're making them better than ever now so yeah i i, I love them as you can see yes we, I mean, there's a few of them right behind you yeah absolutely well i don't want to keep you too long i thank you so much for doing this it was a last second thing and uh, if people want to learn more about brit lightning go to britlightning.com Go to YouTube, check out the uh, new music video from Dixon Red. If you're interested in signing up for Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, it's an amazing experience. David Fishoff has been on this show 
and we discuss it as well. So you can do that. Uh, and then tomorrow night, for whoever's watching this, if you're near Mulvane, Kansas, what was the name of the place again? Yes, the Kansas Star Casino. Kansas Star yes. Casino. Yes. That's going to be an awesome show. And that package is so fun. I mean, it, it's awesome. Look, we need to take that on tour next year. It's really good. I think so, too. And I think that something like that could be in the works. It's fun I, I, to hear your favorite songs from uh, bands that you that you grew up with. And, Britt, you know this. There's so many young people there. The audience is, is very diverse. It is. And I, this year, especially the front row is always teenagers decked out like it's 1987 um, and, you know, zebra striped pants and bandanas. And it is so cool and so fun. It's really coming back. It makes me feel very old, though, I have to say, uh, <laughs> because like my parents would talk about, oh, everyone's dressing like it's the 60s or the 70s. Uh, that was in the 80s. Now that people dress like the 80s, it makes me think, Wow, we've come, you know, I think pretty soon the 80s will be 50 years away or something. That scares me, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. But, uh, I'm going to have to have a drink at your dressing room now because my head is, <laughs> is, is spinning. <laughs> we'll Brit, I, look, I look forward to seeing, like I said, BritLightning.com. Everyone can check it out. And next time there's something to promote, you'll come back and we'll, we'll talk even more. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's always great talking to you and really looking forward to rocking out with you this weekend. Thank you. Sounds good, Britt. Okay, thank you everyone for watching. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe.